welcome you guys to a deep dive into a world of uh, crinoline and quiet rebellion. We're going back in time to 19th century England with none other than Agnes Grey. Her diaries, to be precise, these aren't just, you know, historical accounts. They give us a glimpse into the life and mind of a young woman in a world full of societal constraints. You know what I mean? It really is like stepping right into one of those Jane Austen novels, but with an extra dose of reality. We've got excerpts from the novel Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. And let me tell you, Anne doesn't sugarcoat anything. No, she does not. Agnes's story is powerful. You know, it's a testament to the challenges that governesses faced in that era. These were educated women often forced into these positions because of circumstance, but treated as less than by the families they served. Okay, so picture this. Agnes bright, capable and ready to take on the world. She lands her first job with his Bloomfield family, and you think, new start right. But these kids are something else. Tom the eldest is like a mini Napoleon in the making. His behavior speaks volumes about the sense of entitlement among the upper classes then. Imagine, even as a child, he's learning to exert control over others, even the governess hired to educate him. It's almost like he sees Agnes as a piece of furniture, not even a person. And then there's Marianne, who'd rather stuff her face with sweets than open a book. And it wasn't just childish mischief. This disregard for education was often encouraged by the parents themselves. Formal education for girls was seen as less important, you know, focused on accomplishments like playing music or drawing, things that would attract a husband rather than cultivate their minds. It's kind of heartbreaking because Agnes really wants to instill a love of learning in these children, but it's like trying to teach a brick wall to sing. And if the kids weren't enough, there's Mrs. Bloomfield, the head of the house. Ha, ah, Mrs. Bloomfield, a perfect example of a well-to-do woman more concerned with appearances than substance. Agnes must have felt so stifled with her constantly looking over her shoulder. Oh, absolutely. Remember that part where Agnes talks about Mrs. Bloomfield's obsession with how the roast beef is carved? It's like her whole world revolves around these little details of etiquette and social standing. It's a fascinating look at what people prioritized back then. While Agnes is struggling with unruly children and a lack of respect, Mrs. Bloomfield's only worried about keeping up appearances. And we can't forget this constant scrutiny and criticism from the parents was something many governesses had to put up with. Yeah. It wasn't just about teaching the children, it was about navigating all these social expectations and constantly proving you were good enough. Exactly. A classic power dynamic. The governess depended on the family for her income and housing, so she just had to endure it. Which makes it even more interesting when Agnes finds real kindness and appreciation, not from the wealthy Bloomfields, but from people like Nancy Brown, who comes from a much humbler background. Exactly. This comes up again and again in the novel. It challenges our assumptions about where true compassion comes from. It reminds us that human decency can be found in the most unexpected places. It doesn't matter what social class you're from or how much money you have. It's like Anne Bronte is subtly asking us, who are the truly wealthy here? Is it those with material possessions or those with empathy and genuine connection? That's a deep question. And that exploration of class dynamics and societal expectations is a big part of what makes Agnes Gray's story so captivating. But we can't forget about the romance we mentioned earlier. Enter Mr. Weston, a man who couldn't be more different from the stuffy, self-important gentleman Agnes usually meets. Ah, uh, Mr. Weston. He's like a breath of fresh air in Agnes's restricted world. Kind, thoughtful, curate, devoted to his parish. And did I mention easy on the eyes? Okay, maybe that's me projecting a little bit. You have to admit, there's a spark there. There's definitely a mutual attraction. But remember, this is Victorian England we're talking about. Agnes is a governess. He's a curate. There are a lot of societal rules and expectations. It's like they're walking on a tightrope trying to navigate their feelings while also trying to be proper apart. Agnes even questions her own feelings wondering if it's even okay for her to think about love given her position. And that internal conflict she's dealing with just adds another layer to her already complex story. It highlights the limitations placed on women of her station, even when it came to love. It makes you want to reach back in time and give her a hug and be like, you deserve to be happy, Agnes, go for it. Mm. But of course, it's not that easy in the rigid world of 19th century England. Definitely. But that's what makes Agnes's story so relatable even today. Don't we all face societal pressures and expectations when it comes to love and relationships? Absolutely. And that's what makes these deep dives so fascinating. We explore these historical accounts, but we always find these threads that connect us to the past, to the things that make us human. Exactly. As we learn more about Agnes's journey, we'll see how she handles these challenges, how she finds her voice, how she discovers her own path to happiness and fulfillment. So we've seen Agnes deal with the ups and downs of the Bloomfield family. But get this, her story takes a turn when she leaves them and ends up with the Murray family. 
And it's not just a change of scenery. The Murrays are wealthy and upper class too, but they're totally different from the Bloomfields. Right. It's like a whole different world. Hmm. The Murrays are all about being sophisticated social connections and making sure their daughters marry well. Exactly. Remember Rosalie, marrying Sir Thomas Ashby just for his title and money. And Matilda's so focused on finding a husband, it's all a game to them. Like something out of a Jane Austen novel, all that drama. But through it all, Agnes is still our relatable heroine watching it all with a mix of amusement and disappointment. And this is where her emotional journey becomes really important. While she's dealing with the craziness of the Murray household, she's also struggling with her own feelings. You mean about Mr. Weston? Because <laughs> I'm still not over that whole thing with him having feelings for Rosalie poor Agnes. It shows how good of a writer Anne Bronte is, that she lets Agnes experience all these different emotions. The joy of connecting with Mr. Weston, the heartbreak of him liking someone else, and then the strength she finds to move on. Seriously, that kind of rejection could crush anyone. But Agnes, bless her heart, she picks herself up, dusts herself off, and does something incredibly brave. She does. Leaving Horton Lodge, a place that caused her so much pain, and going back home was a huge decision for her. It meant taking back control, refusing to let her circumstances define her. And it's not just about running away from her problems either. Remember how much she loves those quiet moments with her family. It's like going back to her roots allows her to heal and rediscover who she is. Absolutely. That theme of finding strength in where you come from, finding comfort in familiar places, it's really powerful. It reminds us that even when things are tough, we can find peace in the people and places we love. It's like that saying, there's no place like home. And for Agnes, going home isn't just about physically being there. It's about going back to her values, to the things that give her life meaning. And that renewed sense of purpose leads her to something new and exciting. Remember how it ends. Agnes, her mother, and her sister decide to open their own school. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Talk about girl power, Victorian era style. I love that she takes charge and creates a future where she's the one in control. It's a powerful statement, especially for women back then. By starting their own school, Agnes and her family are creating a space free from all the rules and expectations of society. It's like they're saying, we're not playing by your rules anymore, we're making our own. Wow. And I think you're gonna do great. I agree. Agnes's journey from that first governess job to deciding to forge her own path shows how resilient the human spirit can be. It's a reminder that even when we face challenges, even when society tries to hold us back, we always have the power to choose our own way to decide what will make us happy. It's like she goes from being someone who just observes to becoming the author of her own story. And that's a really strong message, especially for anyone listening who feels stuck or unsure of what to do next. Absolutely. Agnes Gray's story reminds us that it's never too late to change, to break free from what's expected of us, and to create a life that reflects our passions and values. You know, it's funny. We started talking about how Agnes Gray gives us this raw look at what it was like to be a governess back then. Yeah. But going through her story, it's so much more than just about her job. You're right. It's like social commentary disguised as a coming of age story. Really? And throughout it all, you see these themes of love and loss and the courage to be true to yourself. Definitely. And speaking of love, can we talk about Mr. Weston? Talk about a slow burn. Their connection is a great example of how Bronte flips the script. In a society obsessed with status and marrying well, Agnes and Mr. Weston find comfort in shared values and connecting on an intellectual level. Right. Those conversations about books and faith, even their little arguments about morality, those weren't just flirty banter, were they? It felt like a real meeting of the minds. Exactly. And that's what makes their relationship so satisfying in the end. It's not because of societal pressure or convenience. It's a love story built on mutual respect, shared beliefs, and a genuine appreciation for who they are as people. It's like Bronte saying, hey, true happiness isn't about titles or money. It's about real connection. That's something that still rings true today, don't you think? Absolutely. Agnes Gray's journey reminds us that it doesn't matter what time period you're in. True fulfillment is about staying true to who you are, going after what you're passionate about, and building relationships with people who get you. It's about finding your people even if they're not who society says you should be with. Exactly. And in the end, that's what makes Agnes Grey such a timeless and relatable character. She's not waiting around for some Prince Charming. She's a woman who takes charge of her own life, deals with heartbreak and disappointment with grace and resilience, and creates a life full of meaning on her own terms. As we wrap up our deep dives into Agnes Grey's world, what stood out to you most about her story? Was it how resilient she was, how committed she was to learning and bettering herself, or maybe how she never gave up on finding love? Those are all great takeaways. 
For me, it's that unwavering spirit, that refusal to let life define her that really sticks with me. It reminds us that we all have that strength inside of us, that ability to overcome obstacles, to go against the grain, and to build a life that's both meaningful and fulfilling. So as you go about your day, remember Agnes Gray and let her journey inspire you to embrace your own 